Uh, my name is Teresa. I am a grad student within the Agricultural Education and Communication Department. Um, and so as part of being in the department, I have this awesome opportunity to work with Streaming Science. And for those of you who don't know, Streaming Science is a college student um, project-based learning science literacy program. And so as part of that program, we really try to connect different audiences with science and whether that's middle and high school students or teachers, we really try to connect real world scientists with those new audiences to increase science literacy across the uh, board. And so today um, we are working on our new um, program and that is the water around us. And so on today's episode, you're gonna learn um, and have the opportunity to learn directly from a water scientist and that's Dr. Reisinger. But before I introduce him, I'd really like to introduce someone else and she's also another um, grad student within the department and she's working with um, Streaming Science to also work on this program. And that is Jacqueline. So go ahead, Jacqueline, and introduce yourself. Hi everyone, my name is Jacqueline. I am a first year doctoral student in the Department of Agricultural Education and Communication. Uh, I, as Teresa mentioned, I also help produce uh, streaming science programs. And today what I'm going to be doing is just watching kind of the board for any questions you're posting and make sure that they are asked to our scientists. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing all the different things you wanna talk about with water. All right, and let's move on to Dr. Reisinger. First of all, thank you so much for being here. And we are super excited to have you here and thank you so much. Go ahead. Great. Thanks a lot for uh, introducing me, Teresa, and for setting this up. Uh, thanks to Jacqueline and Teresa for all they're doing um, behind the scenes to make sure all these technical issues are resolved. Um, we originally started this program with the idea of uh, Skyping directly with an individual classroom. Um, so a few weeks ago, about a week or two prior to um, the whole situation uh, kind of ex escalating, um, I actually had Skyped with a classroom of fourth and fifth graders from Arizona and was planning on doing a couple more rounds of Skyping with other classrooms. But now, obviously, uh, schools are closed throughout the country and throughout the world. And so Teresa, Jacqueline, um, the other grad students, and the professor of the Streaming Scientist Streaming Science Program suggested that we try out this Facebook Live approach. Um, and so this is our first time doing this, so we apologize for any technical issues. Um, this is my first time uh, doing this type of science outreach. But um, as Teresa said, my name is AJ Reisinger. I'm an assistant professor of urban soil and water quality at the University of Florida. I'm in the soil and water sciences department. I've been an assistant professor for three years and my background is primarily focused on nutrient dynamics and uh, pollutants of streams, rivers, lakes, and ponds. And I've worked across a wide range of environments spanning really pristine mountain rivers to agricultural fields to uh, heavily populated urban cities. So most of what I'm planning on talking about today is primarily focused on urban development and urban activities and how those influence water quality, because that's most of the work that I do these days. And so uh, I'm gonna kind of talk through this PowerPoint, this short PowerPoint presentation that I put together. It's gonna describe how the things we do on the landscape and in our daily lives affect water quality. Um, throughout throughout our environment. And then we're gonna kind of open it up to a question and answer session. Um, and I believe Jacqueline will be kind of fielding questions and relaying them to me. So if you have questions while the PowerPoint is going on, just let me know. Um, Jacqueline will try to flag me down and stop me, but if I don't get to your question immediately, I'll definitely get to it by the end of the PowerPoint. It'll probably be about 10 minutes or so um, if I go straight through. So, all right, let's go ahead and get started unless there's any questions. Are we good to go, Teresa and Jacqueline? Cool, I'm getting the thumbs up, awesome. All right, so today, the title of today's presentation is The Water Around Us. Um, and I like to start any presentation that I give um, focused on water quality and human activities by highlighting the fact that most people these days live in cities. This is a nighttime sky view of the continental United States. 
Um, so what you see in white um, and yellow, those are actually street lights and house lights and any, any nighttime lighting that we use. So the, anywhere that there's no lights popping up, that's where there's nobody really living in dense enough populations to show a, um, a visual light display from space. So these are satellite images that really show how concentrated we as a society are living. Um, back in about the 1950s, the majority of the United States population began living in cities. So there were more people living in cities than on farms and in rural communities. And in the 2000s, the entire global population uh, transitioned to a majority uh, urban city dwelling population. There's a variety of reasons for that. Um, industry and social governance and economic factors. Um, it doesn't take as many people to farm the food we need because there's uh, large commercial farms available, that sort of thing. But uh, for the variety of reasons that there are, people continue to move to cities um, and it's expected to increase exponentially. So if we think about the state of Florida where I live, uh, in 2010, there were 17 million people by 20, uh, 2019. So the most recent estimate that I saw, there was 21 million people. And the estimates are that by 2070, there will be 34 million people living in Florida. So that's a lot of people moving to Florida and 90% or more live in cities. So as we as our populations are growing and more and more people move to cities, we are um, changing the way we interact with the landscape and the environment. And that's having impacts on our water quality. So most people live in cities, but everyone lives in a watershed. So this next figure that um, hopefully Teresa is advancing the slides for. Um, all right, cool. Thumbs up. Uh, this next figure, this shows a map of the United States and the major watersheds throughout the entire United States. So I'll tell you a little bit about what, what a watershed is in a second, but basically this just separates where water is moving across the landscape. So the big pink area in the center of uh, the United States, that's the entire Mississippi River watershed. All of the lines that are moving through these watersheds that look kind of like veins, those are streams and creeks and rivers that are draining our landscape. So I really like this visualization because it shows that there's a lot of different watersheds throughout the United States and throughout the world, but everywhere that we live, it's a watershed. No matter who you are or where you're living, you're living in a watershed. And so a watershed is actually, um, it's the area of land where all of the rainwater and precipitation that falls on the same area will eventually drain to the same location. So this cartoon diagram is showing an example or theoretical watershed. Um, and to the left and right edges of the diagram, you can see that there are dashed lines that represent um, ridges or watershed divides. So if there was a mountain range, for example, one side of the mountain range, water would flow one way. The other side of the mountain range, water would flow the other way. So everything that has all of the water flowing into the same location represents a watershed. So water or rainwater or snow that falls anywhere on this watershed will run across the landscape, flow through streams and rivers and wetlands and groundwater, and eventually um, be exported through the same location. So if this was the Mississippi River watershed, for example, um, the water could be raining in uh, Montana and take multiple years to reach the Gulf of Mexico, but eventually it reaches the Gulf of Mexico. And along the way, it interacts with all the different landscape factors that are occurring throughout the watershed. So things like agricultural fields or urban development are all altering how fast water moves across the landscape and the different chemicals and pollutants that are within that landscape. So, or that are within that water as it drains. So if we look back to um, the fact that everyone lives in a watershed, if you can find where you live on this map, you can probably see where rainwater will eventually flow um, after it falls onto your land. So I grew up in Nebraska, which is really kind of in the middle of the Mississippi River watershed. And it would take a couple of years probably for any rainwater to eventually reach the Gulf of Mexico. But over that time period, all of that water that fell on my house would eventually uh, move across a sidewalk, a road, maybe a cornfield, through a small stream, through some eroding valleys and into the Mississippi River. So 
that water is interacting with all the different things that we as humans do on the landscape. So everything we do in a watershed can have an impact. So this uh, slide here just has a few different examples of pictures of different activities on the landscape. Things like chemical manufacturing that you see at the top left here. It's kind of obvious how if you um, are manufacturing chemicals and discharging your waste directly into a river, that's going to alter the chemicals and the water quality of that river. But if you're building a house um, in, in a new neighborhood, the decisions you make on how you're going to landscape your, your house, how big your house is going to be, what type of concrete you're going to use, what type of fertilizer and pesticides you're going to use, all of those decisions can have short and long-term implications for water quality because they can change how many different chemicals you have to use and how fast water moves off of your own residential landscape and into um, the greater aquatic ecosystem. If we build high rises in uh, downtown uh, West Palm Beach, like the picture at the top right, that's great for having high density housing and people love those high rises for the great views. But as the, as the rainwater hits the landscape, hits the concrete, it isn't able to infiltrate through the soil. And instead, instead it will move directly across that concrete and into the uh, estuary or the ocean. Um, so there is less filtering time available. All of the waste materials that we throw into the trash, they don't just vanish and go nowhere. They eventually get taken to a landfill. Landfills have to be uh, taken care of in appropriate ways, but it's still waste that still interacts with water and uh, rainwater and precipitation and other things. Agriculture is another contributor to water quality issues. We all need to eat. I love uh, eating. I hope you all do too. My dad was a farmer, so I have a fond place in my heart for agriculture, but there are chemicals that are being used, fertilizers, pesticides, that sort of thing. So proper agricultural practices are necessary to require to improve water quality. And finally, simple things that we do in our daily lives, like when we take our dog for a walk, there's nutrients and other contaminants uh, in our dog feces. So if you let your dog poop on the sidewalk or on the grass, that's fine. It has dogs have to poop just like everybody else, but you should pick up that poop with a bag, not only because it's gross to just have a bunch of dog waste everywhere, but it's actually protecting and improving water quality by taking that uh, poop and putting it into the landfill so it slows down how quickly it reaches the water. <clears throat> so there are a bunch of different water quality issues in urban environments, and there are a bunch of different reasons why these things are issues. There's nutrient pollution. That's one of the more common things that we think of. So if we apply fertilizers on our landscape, um, apply too many fertilizers or don't apply them at the correct time periods, they could run off and make their way into our uh, creeks or rivers. Um, and that leads to things like algal blooms and uh, hypoxia, which is low oxygen in our water. Oh, OK. Wow. OK, sorry. I've got some questions from Jacqueline. I will pause for a second. All righty. So um, hopefully, I'm not quite sure if we've switched over. Hopefully, people can see me. Teresa, am I good to go? OK, one second. All righty. Okay, so we have our first question from those that are watching um, and it is from Carrie Adams and she says, what can kids do to lower our impact? My microphone is muted. It's a great question, Mary. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some things that we can do and kids can do um, in a little bit. But some of the, the, I think, most important things that kids can do are really inside of your household. You can be more conscientious about how much water you use. You can uh, take shorter showers. You, you can turn off your faucets when you're brushing your teeth. You can make sure that if you are digging a hole in your yard, maybe don't dig up so much of uh, the landscape because as that soil erodes and runs off your landscape, that can have major issues. 
don't throw anything down your sinks or down your faucets or down your toilets. That's an especially important one. I know it might be fun for uh, you to play with your toys in the bath or in the toilet. Um, it might be fun to see where something goes down the drain. Um, and there's another question I'll get to in a second. Um, but the only things that we should ever put down the drain, this is an important one for both adults and for kids, are the three Ps. Uh, paper, pee, and poop. So toilet paper and uh, whatever comes out of your body are the only things that should go down the drain. Uh, there's no such thing as a flushable wipe. There's no such thing as uh, Kleenex or paper towels that are safe to be flushed other than toilet paper. So those are a few things that kids can do. And I think we'll talk a little bit more about some other uh, ideas in a second. All right, next question, Jacqueline. Teresa, if you can let me know when. Okay, awesome. Okay, we actually have two more questions and a comment. Um, so Carrie Adams says, wow, there are a lot of chemicals in the world. Um, and then we have a question from Claire Luizzo, and she would like to know how trash from the ground can get into water. Okay. Do you want your other? Yeah, I'm good. How trash from the ground can get into the water. So how i'm hearing that how i'm interpreting that question is if you littered on your yard for example or on your street how could that get into the water that's my that's how i'm going to respond to that and claire if you have uh if that's not what you're asking uh feel free to clarify a little bit more but um if you throw a a piece of trash a piece of plastic onto your yard it's going to sit there for a while, but eventually um, after a big storm or after a big windy day or something like that, you're going to come back and that piece of trash isn't going to be on your yard anymore. Um, it's not just magically disappearing and going uh, with the trash ferry. Uh, it's going somewhere else. And so if it rains, the rainwater will take everything that's on the landscape that will flow with that rainwater and uh, bring it along with it. So we talk a lot about how landscapes are connected. So water moves downstream, rainwater moves from your house or from the road into a pond and into a creek. And anything that's, with, that's in that water is gonna move too. So um, storm water, storm events are a big way that litter can move. Uh, litter uh, will build up in different locations on the landscape. But eventually as that water moves, it will either clog up an important pipe and then need to be uh, cleared out by um, a maintenance crew or it will be uh, flushed downstream to a natural water body. Another question. All right, let's keep this going. This is great. Perfect. So I have a video, AJ, that shows that pollution, um, and this shows um, that one of was taken at the Sweetwater Treatment Wetlands uh, here in Gainesville, Florida. Uh, it's so the Sweetwater Treatment Wetlands were built by the city of Gainesville as a natural solution to improving water quality. So it's not a natural wetland. It was actually built, constructed, designed, and engineered by city engineers. <clears throat> but it's capitalizing on these natural processes that uh, wetland provides things like nutrient removal, um, slowing down water to allow for more uh, litter uh, settling, and then you can go and just scoop out that litter with a big backhoe or something. And it also provides some really cool natural uh, activities. There's really great birding and wildlife viewing out there. So it's a really uh, popular city park, but it's also treating a lot of our wastewater. Okay, so we had, um, I don't know if I'm, if you can hear me or see me, but um, so we have two questions. Um, Dr. Reisinger, do you want them both or do you want one at a time? Uh, go ahead and give both of them to me and I'll, I'll write them down. 
Okay, so the first question is from Anthony, and he wants to know if every house used rain barrels, how will that impact water going into the ecosystem? Is it good, bad, or neither? Mm -hmm. And then the second question was from Sarah, and she wants to know how long does it take to teach for, I'm assuming she means for trash to decompose in the ocean? Okay, just a second. Uh, all right. So the first question is related to uh, if every house used rain barrels, would that be good, bad, or neutral for the environment? So before I answer the question, I'm just going to take a step back and explain what rain barrels are. Um, so as I, as I briefly mentioned, when rain falls on concrete or on a house, it doesn't have the opportunity to uh, move through the soil, and instead it just runs off really rapidly off of the landscape. Um, and so that causes some downstream flooding issues and can also cause some uh, water quality issues as well. And so activities that we can do to slow down how fast that rainwater moves across our landscape um, in urban areas in particular is super important. So some of you have, well, no, I won't get into that. But rain barrels are one example of a way to slow down water and to also repurpose this rainwater for another beneficial use. So these rain barrels um, are usually connected to a gutter system coming off of your house. So all of the rain that falls on your roof will flow through the gutters into a rain barrel. Instead of running off into the street, it'll go into this rain barrel. And then that rain barrel can be used for irrigation for your landscape. So not only does it stop that rainwater from causing downstream flooding, it reduces your need for water to be used for irrigation for your yard in the future. So rain barrels are definitely a positive thing um, in terms of uh, protecting downstream water quality while also in improving water conservation. Um, they are, if every house used rain barrels, it would be good, but it wouldn't solve our issues. A rain barrel isn't going to be able to capture all of, the, all of the rainwater that happens on a single house, let alone everything that happens on your yard, on your driveway, on the sidewalks, that sort of thing. But rain barrels are one example of, of something that a family could do at their home um, to construct and build their own rain barrel and then um, learn about how that is actually reducing um, the impacts of runoff on downstream ecosystems. I know here in Florida, a lot of the county extension agents and county extension offices offer rain barrel classes where they teach you how to construct your own. Um, and I imagine that's similar in other states as well. So if you're interested in learning more about rain barrels, I would definitely suggest connecting with your county extension agents. Um, I also know that there's some rain barrels that are for sale at large box stores, like, yeah, large, large box stores. The other question was how long does it take for uh, trash to decompose in the environment, in the marine environment in particular? Um, <clears throat> to be completely honest, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I have some colleagues that do study trash and plastics in the environment, in freshwater and in marine environments, but I don't know exactly or even, I couldn't even give you an estimate of how long it takes for trash to decompose. I do know that trash in the ocean is a super uh, important issue because um, a variety of things will consume the trash and the plastic and that can affect their feeding and their reproduction and other issues. Um, and also, I know that it takes a while to decompose, but I'm not sure how long. Yes, another question. Awesome. Okay, so we have another question, a follow-up question from Sarah. And she said, if everyone stopped polluting, how long would it take for our oceans and lakes to clear out? <clears throat> okay, good, cool. That's another good question, Sarah. Um, and again, it's a question that I'm not gonna be able to give you a very specific answer to. Um, one thing I will say is that it will take a lot longer than you might think. Um, I think that water quality versus air quality are two common things that people think about. So I've heard people talking about how because people aren't going to work right now and there's less people on the roads, air quality is really improving because there's less uh, fossil fuel combustion and other things like that, less particulates and less smog in the air. And that's awesome, that's really great. Um, 
but water quality probably isn't going to respond on such a short time span because the drivers and the impacts of water quality uh, take a lot longer to recover. So even if, for example, so again, this is, I live in Florida, so a lot of my uh, anecdotes are for Florida. Um, lake Okeechobee in Florida is a, a kind of a, it's the largest lake in Florida. It's a really big lake, but it's also a very polluted lake with uh, nutrient inputs from a variety of sources, including uh, urban development and agricultural impacts and uh, septic systems. There's a whole bunch of sources. But there's an estimate that even if we completely stopped all of the sources of phosphorus, which is a major uh, nutrient pollutant of the lake, even if we stopped all of the phosphorus from going into the lake today, there's at least 50 years worth of phosphorus that's built up within the sediments to uh, continue to have the same level of phosphorus pollution in that lake. Um, I think that Lake Okeechobee and phosphorus are two kind of worse well, maybe not worst case, but on the on the bad side of examples, um, some systems would improve more quickly. Some systems would improve more slowly. Um, streams and rivers would probably improve more quickly because the water is always flowing and turning over more rapidly. Lakes and the ocean um, have the well, water doesn't move through those systems as fast, so it's going to take longer for them to recover. Yes, I see another question. Okay, I love all these questions. This is getting good. So uh, Megan has a question and she is asking, when it rains, does the water go to the ocean or does it go to lakes? Megan, that's a good question. And it's um, it really depends on where you live. Um, where I live, my house, when it rains in my house, eventually that water actually goes below ground into the aquifer. Um, and then that groundwater eventually will come back up as a spring and eventually it will go to the ocean. Um, for the most, most people, uh, where they live for most watersheds, the water will eventually go to the ocean. Um, there are some cases where that's not true. For example, if you live in the Great Lakes region, um, the Great Lakes watersheds all lead into the Great Lakes. They don't lead into the ocean. Um, but really, if you're further south than mid Indiana in the United States, um, and then you're probably going to be draining to either the Gulf of Mexico, the Atlantic Ocean, or the Pacific Ocean. Um, even if your water might in the short term go to a lake, um, the bigger watershed perspective, like, where your water goes depends on the, how long of a time frame you're asking. If you're asking like in the next month, then it might go to a lake. Uh, but if you're asking in the next 10 years or 100 years, eventually that water is probably going to go to the ocean. Cool. Any other questions right now? I don't really trying to let me go back to my PowerPoint and we don't have to. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, Teresa, could you put the slide up with the multiple pictures and the arrows? Cool. All right. So this is just uh, kind of uh, some pictures that highlight some of the work that we do in my research group. And it talks about how water moves across our urban landscapes and how at every step of the way we could have a positive or a negative effect on this water. So in my lab, I have uh, students that study how different uh, soil and landscape practices during the construction of your home affect how much fertilizer and how much irrigation you're going to need 10, 20 years down the road for your lawn. We also study how different landscape management practices like um, using compost instead of fertilizer, how that affects our soil health and the runoff of nutrients to the landscape. So these are more things for mom and dad to think about. Um, think about who is taking care of your lawn and how to do it best. If you're a teenager and you're mowing your lawn, um, that's good. It's good to mow your lawn, but make sure that you um, bag, either mulch your uh, grass clippings back onto your yard or bag them. Don't uh, 
don't put your grass clippings on the street or on your driveway because eventually they will run off the landscape into a stormwater drain. Like the top middle picture here shows, this is one of my neighbors dumping their grass clippings directly into a stormwater drain. I think this was accidental because it was a windy day. And so I picked up the, the bag and I think they were trying to do the right thing. But if your grass clippings get into a stormwater drain, then eventually they're going to go into the stormwater system, which can include things like a stormwater pond down at the bottom, which is designed to uh, control water quality and control flooding. But if we don't treat them well, then they won't uh, work as well. Or they could move through an urban stream, which has a lot of potential to reduce nutrients. But if we keep uh, adding more and more chemicals to the environment, then um, eventually those nutrients will flow to a place like Lake Okeechobee, which is shown at the bottom, where we get algal blooms. And so algal blooms are an important thing to be concerned about because they're kind of gross. They smell bad. And they actually have, uh, can be really dangerous for your health or for your pet's health. So if you have an algal, if you see a really green uh, body of water, um, unless you know for sure that it's safe, um, algal blooms can have significant human health risks. So check with your local uh, environmental protection service to find out if there are any harmful algal blooms in your region. Um, so the next slide that I have is talking a little bit about what you can do. Um, I don't think we really need to spend any more time on that because we've already covered a lot of that and even gone beyond that. But then uh, at the very end is some other topics that I could talk about. One thing that I'm really interested in is how uh, pharmaceuticals and personal care products, so like prescription drugs or coffee and caffeine or antibiotics, how those affect water quality. I like talking about that. Um, or if you have any random question about water uh, in your household, in your city, anywhere, um, I'm here to answer all things water um, for as long as you all will have me. Do we have any questions? Okay, I'm not seeing anything. I'll leave it open for a little bit longer. Yes. Uh, while we're waiting for some questions to roll in, um, I have questions for you that I think someone in one of our previous Skype uh, programs might have asked, a similar one. So when thinking about filters, like water filters, either in like a Grail water bottle or a Brita filter, when you're talking about these different things getting into our water sources, do those filters actually make the water clean and take out all those products or do they only work for some different um, things in the water? Yes. Okay. Yep. I'll wait for that to come back to me. Yeah. So that's a good question. And I, yeah, I remember there were um, some questions about drinking water quality and the pollutants that I've been talking about, like nutrients or pharmaceuticals, that sort of thing. Um, and I want to first emphasize that drinking water is treated to a much higher standard than stormwater or any water that runs off of your landscape. So none of the pollutants that I've talked about should be of concern for you when you're drinking out of your faucet. Um, every, or at least here in the United States, every municipal drinking water supplier has to pass very stringent testing to ensure that their water is uh, high enough quality to drink. That being said, that there can be some um, minerals and other things dissolved in the water that can change the taste or change the odor a little bit. They might not have a health implication, but they might just make the water taste less good. Um, and so if you have uh, water that you don't really like the taste, that's one reason to uh, look into a, a Brita filter on your tap or on your fridge. We have a filter on our fridge and we use it um, mostly just for a taste taste reason now. Um, and in terms of bottled water, um, here in Florida, I mentioned that we have a lot of groundwater and aquifers. Our drinking water comes from the same exact aquifer where a lot of bottled water is sourced. So we have the exact, they pull the same water that we do. Other drinking water could be coming from mountain glaciers or whoever knows what. Um, 
to me, I would strongly advise against drinking bottled water if you have a safe drinking water source, just because not only does that bottled water, it's not really that any better for you, but it also um, requires the production of the bottle itself, which um, uses up a lot of plastic and a lot of energy. And you have to transport that water all across the country or all across the world. So that leads to some fossil fuel costs and some greenhouse gas emissions. So overall, um, if you live somewhere with a safe, clean access to drinking water, then definitely I think drinking out of the fountain or out of the faucet. There are parts of the world where you don't have access to clean drinking water. Um, and in that case, there are specific filters that have been designed to remove harmful bacteria, harmful uh, chemicals from the water. Um, so I'm not as familiar with those. So I'm not definitely not saying that everywhere in the world you can drink out of your faucet. But um, most places here in the U.S. you can, um, although it's something to think about. Yeah. OK, another question. OK, so. First off, Autumn and Parker want to say thank you for sharing with them today. Um, and then we have a question from Ralphie, who wants to know how long does it take water to get into the aquifer? Does it matter which aquifer, like, like the Floridian or the Ogallalas? Did I say that correctly? <laughs> yeah. So waiting for the, okay. Yeah, so. Um, I don't really know how long it takes for water to get into the aquifer, and I, but I do know that it's going to vary a lot on where that water is following and where it's moving and what aquifer you're talking about. Um, so here in Florida, there are sinkholes that occur, and those sinkholes are basically just direct windows into the aquifer. Um, so if water goes to a sinkhole, it's going to get into the aquifer really fast. Um, but I, the papers that I've read, I think the average for the Florida aquifer, um, is you kind of start to see the water quality effects of, uh, human activities about 20 to 30 years down the road in springs. So it takes maybe 20 to 30 years for rainwater to, on average, to move through the aquifer. But a lot of that water is hundreds of thousands of years old in the aquifer itself. So some water moves really fast through special flow paths, through these sinkholes and things like that. But a lot of that water is really old. Um, the Ogallala Aquifer, that's throughout most of the Great Plains. Um, so I, where I grew up um, was on top of the Ogallala Aquifer. Um, it has some different geology. And so it will take sometimes longer, sometimes shorter for the water to get in there. And it takes a long time for the water to mix and to uh, completely mix. It also depends on where you're pulling the water from. If you have a really deep well versus a shallow well, um, a lot of this is kind of speculation. And so don't quote me on a lot of this, especially the specific numbers. But um, so it, it can take a really long time um, and it will depend on where you're living and what type of aquifer you have and the geology. Okay, so we have a couple more questions actually from our friends on the streaming science team. But first, Molly and Daisy say thank you. Um, and our question from our other streaming science folks um, are, what do you love most about science and how did you become a scientist? <clears throat> Great. Those. Thank you for the for the wonderful prompts. Um, so when I was so I grew up on a farm um, in a small town in Nebraska, and but I was always really fascinated by science all throughout junior high and high school. I went to college, and when I went to college, I assumed I would become a medical doctor because that's the only thing I knew you could do with a science degree. So I was like, oh, I like science. I'll probably be a doctor. Um, when I started taking pre-med classes in college, I realized that I didn't want to be stuck inside all day. So I started uh, just reaching out to various research labs uh, in my program and got connected with a few different labs. I started working just as a, a technician. I washed dishes in a fruit fly disease lab, really random. Um, but that kind of exposed me to the research process. It's actually a, a really important lab. They study like dengue fever and all kinds of disease, then malaria. But I, I knew that I 
again, I didn't want to be inside all day, every day. And so I was like, okay, I like this lab and this research idea, but I don't really love the research that they're doing. So then I just randomly saw a posting for an undergraduate research position in a stream ecology lab. Um, and I saw that the position was for a summer to spend a summer in Alaska. And I thought, oh, that's awesome. I want to spend my summer in Alaska and do stream ecology. And so that was kind of just my first foray into it. I lucked out into um, figuring out that I really liked working in water. I really uh, like understanding how it kind of integrates all of the uh, impacts of humans on the land. Um, so everything that I've done, everywhere that I've been, I've really been interested in how the things that we do as people affect the water quality downstream. So I've, in Southeast Alaska, it's like very remote, very pristine, but I was studying how uh, the timber harvest industry affects salmon. And then I worked in Kansas and studied how uh, stopping wildfires from occurring, how that affects small prairie streams. I looked at how corn uh, agriculture affects large river nutrient dynamics. So I've always been interested in how human activities um, are affecting our water quality. The thing that I probably like the most about science and being a scientist, honestly, is that my job is a, is a, gives me a wide variety of things to do on any given day. So I spend a lot of my time writing. I spend a lot of my time reading. I spend a lot of my time um, doing data analysis and doing statistics and making figures. Um, I actually am an extension specialist. So what that means is a big part of my job is to do science communication and outreach with people throughout the state of Florida and beyond. And so I actually get to just talk about science and teach people about the scientific process for my job, which I think is really cool. So I think it's the the day to day variability that keeps me excited and keeps me engaged with the process. I'm not just doing the same thing day in, day out. So I think hopefully that answers your question. Uh, I think that answered the question very well, and it might lead in perfectly to our next question from Autumn. And she had asked, why did you take the study water, which I we touched on a little bit, but you can, if you want to speak about that a little bit more for Autumn, and then also maybe explain, um, you can also talk about the different kinds of like focuses people that research water have. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, for sure. Um, so actually, the probably the first impetus when I knew that I wanted to do some type of uh, science research outside, um, one of the reasons I was actually drawn to water is because as a kid, I was actually terrified of water. Um, I was afraid to get wet. Even I hated being wet. And so it was kind of a face your fear and embrace it thing to start. And then I... Um, I mean, I got to start my career as a water scientist in uh, Pacific salmon streams in Alaska. So I think if anyone enjoys the outdoors and has ever been there, like it's hard not to fall in love with water when that's your first real research exposure to it. Um, and then as I learned more and more about the overall process, I started to realize that more and more I was less interested in those really beautiful, perfect, untouched systems and more interested in the really messed up urban streams or farm ditches, that sort of thing, because I think those are where a lot more important work can be done to improve our environment. Um, yeah, there's a lot of different types of water scientists that you can be. Um, I consider myself an ecosystem ecologist. Um, what that means, that's some fancy words, but what that really means is I look at the entire water body and look at how uh, processes are um, changing what energy and resources move through an entire water body. So you maybe study a whole lake or a whole river um, or a whole stream, that sort of thing. There are also people, there are other types of ecologists that are really interested in specifically um, the interactions between different species um, in aquatic environments. So maybe they're interested in how fish eat bugs and then what that does to the algae that those bugs eat. That would be a community ecologist because they're interested in the whole community of uh, organisms in the water body. There are population ecologists that study one specific type of organism. 
So maybe they really want to know everything there is to know about um, a certain type of mayfly. And so they study like reproduction and growth rates of that specific organism. But then beyond the water ecologists, there's other people that are more interested in the physical aspects of water and how water flows across the landscape or how water interacts with the groundwater. Those people are called hydrologists. They're less concerned or less interested or less focused on the biology. And they're more interested in the physics of um, water, like water running down a hill and interacting with the soil. There are water chemists, aquatic chemists, that they, again, are really just focused specifically on the different chemicals that are in, dissolved in the water. Um, what I do, I do a little bit of uh, water chemistry, a little bit of biology, a little bit of physics. Um, and that's what, another thing that I like about my job, although I'm probably more focused on the biology side. Yes, another question. Okay, so we have two questions. I can give them to you both at the same time, if, if that's how you prefer. Sounds good. Okay, so first question is from Allison. So Allison would like to know why some people do not dispose of their trash properly. I think it's a very, very fair question. Um, and then Nick and Lindsay want to know if you have a fun fact about water that most people don't know. Okay, great. It's fun to hear these questions and uh, guess if I know the people that are asking them. Um, so first uh, question, why don't some people dispose of trash properly? You know, that's a really great question. That's a question that um, you should ask a psychologist or a sociologist, probably. Um, I don't know, <clears throat> but I will say that there, there was a study that was done in Baltimore that showed that the best way to predict how much trash was in a stream or a lake was how many trash cans were in the nearest like kilometer. So if you had more trash cans nearby, there was less trash. So it suggests that for the most part, most people will throw away their trash if they have an easy opportunity to do so. But if they have to go out of their way, they might be less likely to do that. A fun fact about water. That's a good question. So I guess one fun fact, one thing that um, could be fun is for anybody that has ever um, gone swimming in a lake, like a deep lake on a really hot summer day, you probably have jumped off the dock and jumped into the water. And then as you get really deep, it gets like really cold all of a sudden. If, if you've experienced that, awesome. If you haven't, then I'm sorry, go jump in a really hot lake someday. Um, but so what happens there, that's called lake stratification. And what happens is the density of water is really related to its temperature. So as water starts to warm up in a lake in the summer, the hotter water is less dense. So it floats to the surface and the colder water sinks down to the bottom. And as that hot water keeps getting hotter and hotter and hotter, it stays up at the top and keeps warming up. And then that cold bottom water doesn't mix back in. And so that is called a temperature or thermal stratification. And that's why it's colder at the bottom of the water. But that's also really important environmentally because not only is no temperature change occurring at the bottom water, but you also don't get any mixing of oxygen or nutrients or other things like that. So if you have a lot of stratification for a really long time, um, you can get low oxygen events that can actually cause uh, major fish kills and losses of biological uh, diversity in lakes and other water bodies. It's not that fun, I guess, but that's, that's a little known fact. Okay, go ahead, Jacqueline, whenever the video is ready. Okay. Next question. Um, Emily is wondering where sewage drains take water. Okay, that's a good question. Yeah. So sewage drains are, well, yeah, so let's take a step back. Um, whenever you uh, put something down the drain, either flushing it down your toilet, running down your shower, running down your kitchen sink, anything like that, it goes through the drains and it gets uh, taken out of your house. It can either go through a sewage system or through a sewer system, or it can go to a septic tank. So uh, most newer homes in most locations around the world have uh, sewer systems. 
but older homes or more rural homes often have septic tanks. And so a septic tank will take all the water, all of that wastewater that comes out of your house, and it'll drain it to this tank where some water will, where the water will be held in that tank, allowing all the solid waste to settle to the bottom of the tank. And then the liquid then slowly bleeds out into the soil. And so that tank um, prevents uh, some human health issues and can allow for some natural treatment of your wastewater. Um, it's a less ideal way to do it, but uh, if you don't have access to a sewer system, it's one of the only choices. If you do, okay. Um, if you do have a, if you do have a sewer system, then your uh, whatever you flush down the drain will go through the sewer pipes, and eventually it'll be taken to a wastewater treatment plant. There are a variety of wastewater treatment plants with different levels of treatment quality. Um, all of the wastewater treatment plants will also uh, screen out all of the large waste materials, allow all of the solids to settle out. And they'll also uh, provide some disinfection through either ultraviolet light. So that kills off all of the viruses and bacteria that could cause some human health issues. Um, sometimes after that disinfection occurs, the water will be discharged right back into a local stream or river. Other times it will be pushed to some other treatment processes that are designed to remove water quality. So I've been told that after this, maybe one more question, and then we're going to wrap up. Is that okay? No? Sorry, I'm getting a no from Teresa. Yeah. It's, I got something from, maybe it was from Facebook or something, I don't know. It was from Skype. So unfortunately, we are wrapping up on our hour time. Um, for this program, but we just want to say thank you to everyone who watched. Thank you for all your questions. We really appreciate them all. And thank you so much, Dr. Reisinger, for tuning in and answering all these questions. I'm sure all the kids who, and parents and students and teachers who watched really enjoyed it. Thank you to Jacqueline for helping with the, answer these questions. Um, thank you to everyone who helped put together this program. Um, Mr. Luizzo, uh, Dr. Luizzo, everybody who helped, and Jasser. We just want to um, say how appreciative we are and hope you guys really learned about water. And earlier in the comments, if you look back in the comments, we had a survey that we posted in the link. We will repost that survey again. If you guys watch it to take that quick survey, we would really appreciate it. And thank you so much um, for tuning in.